Good afternoon, and welcome to Concord Bookshop. Uh, today we're very pleased to have John Hanson Mitchell here uh, to read and discuss his new book, The Rose Cafe, Love and War in Corsica. Uh, John's the winner of the 1994 John Burroughs Essay Award and has um, authored many books, including Following the Sun, a Bicycle Pilgrimage from Andalusia to the Hebrides, and Looking for Mr. Gilbert, which is the book right here. John, as many of you know, is currently the editor of Sanctuary, the journal of the Massachusetts Audubon Society. Uh, the Rose Cafe <laughs> is about his fascinating experiences on the Mediterranean island of Corsica in the 1960s while a student in Paris. Uh, so here's John. I was going to sit down, but this is such an overwhelming crowd. I think I'll just—I don't need to quote it. Um, I was—I was looking around in this book, uh, which takes place on the Mediterranean island of, of Corsica. I was looking around for a uh, a singular passage that would describe um, the heat and the light uh, uh, and, and the colors, the rich, uh, you know, dense uh, Mediterranean aquamarine and, uh, uh, and the sort of the, the air which is um, uh, there and especially in summer just redolent with the um, flowers of uh, what they call the maquis which will occur, um, you'll hear about maquis uh, in the reading, um, it's the, maquis is the, the dense tangle of um, uh, scrublands that um, characterize the the, um, the lowlands of, of, of Corsica. Corsica. Corsica is very mountainous, um, and uh, it. But it the Maki consists of all the her herbs uh, we know and love. You know, rosemary and thyme and savory and uh, a bay, <laughs> a bay and uh, eglantine and arbutus and rock rose and. You know, it, it, starting in spring, all these things are in flower, and they just bake in the heat. Uh, and so that, that, that redolence just fills the air. Napoleon, who of course is from Corsica, um, used to say that you can smell the island before you can see it, which is, I you know, this is true. So anyway, my story here, I was a student in Europe. I was uh, not, this wasn't a year abroad. Type thing. I was actually enrolled at um, a course at the, at the Sorbonne, and um, I was, I had been, um, well, I worked hard, if I was there, <laughs> uh, and, um, and got enough money to live uh, and go to school, uh, which wasn't really difficult. Um, I went to the Sorbonne, uh, a semester there, Full semester was twenty-two dollars a month, and you know you could you could live in those. This is nineteen sixties, early sixties, sixty to sixty-two. You could live <coughs> very well in Europe uh, on American dollars. You can't do that anymore. So anyway, I was uh, I was enrolled in, 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 in um, at, at the Sorbonne in Paris, and in the spring of. Um, um, the year that I, that I was there. Uh, I was actually there for two years, but in the spring of the first year, I went down to Nice, and I had lived in Nice um, the, the spring before, and had, uh, summer before, and had fallen in with this group of uh, students such as myself, and I knew people there. So, uh, you know, Paris is like this. It's grim in, in winter. It's just like, there's even a word for it. The Paris grisaille, the gray, this is, he covers everything. So I was longing for the sun. And uh, I went down to Nice and joined my, my old friends down there. And on a lark um, in April, um, a, a couple of friends of mine, a person named Armand and his girlfriend Inga, we decided to go out to Corsica. <coughs> and we, we took the ferry over to, to Calvi, which is on the north coast, and then hitchhiked up, um, up the coast to a place called um, yeah, town, a small town called Il Rus. I, I should tell you a little about Corsica. It's, um, it's um, 
the northernmost of the Mediterranean islands. It's nestled in between um, the, the um, west coast of Italy and the south coast of France, up in the up in the corner. And it's uh, shaped like a like a um, fist, kind of, with the north north coast here. The cup course runs up, pointing up toward France. Oh, <laughs> very good. I asked her. To <laughs> uh, here, here it is. You can see. Um, um, let's see here. Where's Il Rus? Uh, there's Il Rus. That's where I worked. France is here. Italy there. Uh, Genoa, right here. Genoa plays an important role in the uh, Corsican history. They were, um, Cors Corsica was always being invaded. Um, there was a Neolithic culture there, the, what they call the Torren. And um, they actually don't know anything about them, except that they built these towers, Torren, the tower builders. And, uh, and they don't even know what the towers were for. And there are also these meniers, you know, these, the, these standing stones there which are unique. There are plenty of standing stones all over um, uh, Western Europe. But the Corsican ones are carved. They have faces. They have these primitive uh, faces and, and, and uh, even sort of sword-like uh, figures that they're holding. So that they're, they are of interest to, to archaeologists. But they only discovered, uh, I mean, they've been known for centuries, but they're only discovered, really, by archaeologists in the 1960s, a little before, fifth, late 50s. Um, and they, they are, those, anyway, these Torrens, um, the, the, after them, the natives, um, of course it was invaded time and time again. Uh, uh, first the Phoenicians and the Greeks, Homer, it plays a role in the, the, the Lystragonians, or Corsicans, uh, in the Odyssey. And um, um, yeah, the Phoenicians, the Greeks, the Romans, who held it for a long time, uh, Seneca was banished there. Um, and then the, uh, it, well, the Paisanos, the people from Pisa. Uh, and then uh, the Genoese. And the Genoese in, in the 14th century took it over 15th century. And they held it for a long time. All these invaders, much hated by the Corsicans. And any, anybody comes in, they repel them. And they always lose, because there weren't very many of them. So then they retreat to the hills, and they regroup, and they make trouble for the invaders, and so on and so forth. And that went on for, you know, 2,000 years, ending with the Nazis. Uh, even the Nazis didn't last very long. Of course, it was the first, um, the first uh, part of, the, uh, of Europe to be liberated. And, uh, of course, the, the uh, Free French, the American, and the, and, and the British were supplying the Corsican uh, resistance fighters. Incidentally, the, the resistance fighters were um, known as um, Makisar. Um, can you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, they were known as the Maquisar uh, because uh, they would retreat and live in the Maquis. No one would go up into the Maquis save the locals. And uh, no matter who you were, I mean, they are not very judgmental on Corsica. That's one of the uh, parts of this story, if you'll see. Um, the the um, you know if you're a, if you're a bandit, if you're a corsair, uh, uh, you know. Contrabandist, uh, um, a Nazi, even in some cases, an errant Nazi, uh, Italian um, fighter, um, uh, criminals of any sort, um, they would hide you, no questions asked. You get back into the Maquis and, and you're safe. So, anyway, I, uh, I, I, we hitchhiked up the, the coast um, toward Cup Course and came upon this little town in Rus, which is now a big tourist town, but back then it was, was pretty quiet. And we came to, um, there's a jetty of, of uh, like a causeway that runs out from Il, Il Rus uh, to a, a little train of islands. And on one of these islands, there was this uh, cafe. We thought it's a cafe, a place called the Rose Cafe. And we stopped there for a drink, and it turned out they had um, upstairs um, bedrooms in this place. And also a little cottage back in the back of the uh, in the back of the kitchen. And uh, this is a really nice setting. I'm absolutely beautiful. You, 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 you know, a big a little terrace out in front of the uh, cafe, and then um, you know a cool veranda with the, the uh, 
martins uh, nesting up above the lamps, and the geckos emerge at night, and look, looking out over the harbor, green uh, harbor with these little uh, red and white uh, fishing smacks, they call the Pointu, uh, coming in and out. Um, and then beyond beyond the, the harbor, the, t the town of Il Rus, you know, this, this, this beautiful stucco, red tile roof town, gray green maquis above that, uh, above the town, above the maquis, sort of a dark band of, of forest with uh, interesting native um, Corsican pines, and above the, the band of forest, these high peaked snowy, snow capped mountains. <coughs> And all underlain by this red, in interesting red granite. Um, Irus, uh, especially known for this uh, red, these red rocks. Um, Irus is red. So anyway, I'm there, and uh, we, what we would do is we'd go into the, uh, we'd hitchhike into the interior and hike around for a while. But um, I actually got, I so liked the Rose uh, Cafe. Um, that, um, that I just began to, uh, I start, start, started to forego these trips, and I would I just hang around there and eat and sleep. And, you know, <laughs> and, uh, I liked the I liked the people there. There were I liked the uh, the group of regular people who come out every night to sit around and play cards and, and late into the night. And uh, no questions asked, by the way. I don't know what these people did <laughs> for a living. Uh, but anyway, here's what happened. Uh, just describing the, the the place, you know, I would, um, you know, I, in the end there, I fell into a strange, perhaps unhealthy lethargy at the Rose Cafe. I would rise early and take a cafe creme and fresh buttered baguette on the terrace above the harbor. Later in the morning, I would slip down to a tiny pebble beach below on the cove below my cottage. I was I stayed in this little cottage out in back of the kitchen. Very primitive. I mean, uh, no electricity, running water, just a narrow monk cell with with, uh, with with a bed and a table and a candle. Um, so I'd go down the little cove below the cottage. I'd go down there for a morning swim, then a morning nap, then a midday meal of local fish, another nap, another swim. I walked to town for coffee in the square, and a aperitif at the bar, dinner, and then a deep, dreamless sleep lulled by the susurration of the sea in the cove below. I would sometimes awake there in the morning and have to figure out where exactly I was, who I was, and what I was doing in this place. I was in a state of suspended animation. It was a good place. You could easily lose yourself there if you so desired. Forget that you ever had a past or a future, or for that matter, uh, uh, or a future. Whoa! <laughs> You could forget you had a past, and yeah, no future, and nothing falls down. And then right, <laughs> you could simply simply slip into that um, state of dolce far niente. That's a sweet nothing to do. Um, for hours, for days, finally for weeks, I simply paced through the uneventful days, swimming, and sleeping, and staring out across the harbor to the green slopes of the hills that rose above the jagged, snow-covered. Uh, uh, beyond. You know, I should say here, uh, I, I forgot to mention the whole reason I was in Europe. Uh, uh, I went there, I went to Paris because if you go to Paris when you're 19 years old and, you're, uh, you, and you want to write, that's where you have to be. You have to go to Paris. And, you know, my intention, you know, was to write. And yet I was in Europe for a year. I was in uh, before, I, I had notebooks. I didn't write a word. Not not a single word. You know, I was just so caught up in the, in the cafe, in the street life. Do you have a question? Can't hear? <laughs> Can you all hear? Yeah. Everybody here? Okay. Um, but um, uh, back to the book, back to the reading. In spite of the languorous nature of the environment, in spite, uh, how, how, however, in spite of the bright weather and the slow and easygoing pace of the people there, there seemed to be some latent story in that place, some powerful, perhaps tragic history that was not spoken of by anyone, but which seemed to manifest itself in the ironic contrast between the brooding snow-capped mountains above the harbor and the light-filled festive air of the coastal community. I don't think I'd ever been in such a powerful setting before. 
I could not say that I was entirely conscious of any of this at the time. I was merely living day to day there, with no plans, no ambition. All I know is that suddenly, feverishly, I began to write. Night after night in my narrow stone cell, I began to fill the notebook that had remained empty for a year. One evening after I had been there for about two weeks, the patron <coughs> drew me aside and poured me a small glass of local mark. That's the total uh, cognac-like drink. And he began to question me about the, my plans for the next few months. I explained that I had nothing definitive in mind as yet. <laughs> you, you have not the papers for France? He asked. Passport, I have. No, I mean working papers. You have none? No, no I'm a student here. I, I have a student card only. It doesn't matter. He said, you want a job? Spring is coming. It's going to be the busy season. You can cut fish for, up, for us, sweep up, do the dishes. I'll teach you some sauces. It's not real work in any case, so the fact that you do not have papers, <laughs> shrug. <laughs> we'll pay you a little something at the end of the season, plus room and board. Nobody out here cares, he said. <laughs> sounds, interesting. sounds interesting, I said, but, but are, you, are you saying that, that it's not exactly legal? <laughs> Possession of working papers was an important issue among the poverty-stricken group of students, um, international students with whom I've traveled. I mean, if you've had working papers, you're in, good in France, you're in good shape. The uh, patron stared out at the black waters beyond the terrace and then looked back at me tiredly. You understand, he said, uh, Corsica is not, uh, ha, how shall I say it, uh, is not well known for its allegiance to the laws of the continent. <laughs> 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 anyway, I, uh, long story or short story, uh, I took the job. And uh, I went back to Nice, I got my stuff, and, uh, and I came, came back there and just fell into this pretty much the same life that I had been leading um, before. It was an easy job. I just cleaned, I bought, except for Sundays. Uh, Sunday nights, the, the ferry uh, would leave for the, for the mainland. And um, that, there was always a big push at the, at the cafe on Sunday nights. Uh, the rest of the week, it was quiet, even in the summer. It was not. It's, a, it's, it's very busy now. But back then, it was just nothing ever happened. You know, I meant to ask, how, how long should I do it, read? As long as you feel it should. Really. <laughs> it's a rainy day. Rainy day. Okay. Oh, all right. Oh, you shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Stoke the fire. Yeah. All right. All right. I'm gonna. I was. I will. Read. Um, uh, some of the characters there. There are. Um, there, there's sort of three groups of, of, of players in this book. Um, that there are the, the local people the, um, that would come out from the, from the town every night. They, it's just religious. They were there. Uh, um, show up usually around dinner time. Some, you know, sometimes they come in through the kitchen and help themselves to the real beds. But uh, um, you know, after the tables were cleared, uh, they would uh, set up and play cards with the patron. And it would go on till about two in the morning. I could be asleep, but um, occasionally I'd get up and go back, and there they were. They, you know. Uh, then there was the crew I worked with. There was a guy named the, the, the boss. Was a guy named Jean Pierre. He was a he was Parisian. And his, uh, he knocked about a while. And he, he knew how to cook, and he got hold of this place. He had, he had a wife, Micheline, who was she really ran. Micheline really ran the place. She had been. She also Parisian. Um, dressed in these, always in these striped Moroccan pants. And she had this curly, long curly hair, green eyes, big hoop earrings. She, she, looked, she looked a little Arab. She, she wasn't. She was Parisian. And then I worked with a guy named Chrétien also. He was a cousin of Jean Pierre. He was from Paris, um, a guy my age. And then there was sort of a man who was my, my mentor, um, a local character named Vincenzo. He was a sous chef. Um, and he took me on as his, uh, as his uh, protege. He taught me a lot of uh, sauces and cooking and uh, advice. And he gave me a lot, a lot of uh, uh, advice in, in life. Uh, the, the one I remember the best is uh, whenever I would complain, he said, "Il y a des gens qui nettoyaient les cabinets. There are those in there are those who clean toilets for a living." 
<laughs> anyway, then, then there were, um, so, so that's the setting. Then there were the guests. And those make up, the guests make up the, the bulk of the characters. And, you know, there was a guy, uh, well, the, the staff had this nasty habit of naming the guests. And sometimes people uh, who were just eating, they're like the English mice, you know, they <laughs> order uh, two plat du jour for the English mice, you know. And, and there was this guy, uh, it was a German man there. Uh, who they called Herr Commandante, and uh, he was there all summer. Uh, he was a um, uh, slightly portly man, took good care of himself. He was thinning blonde hair, blue-green eyes, uh, very smooth, tan skin. He'd come down to the little cove every day for his morning swim uh, in his striped bathrobe, you know, white espadrilles. Uh, carrying a comb and a towel, and at dusk, at, at sundown, he'd always go up to this little um, um, little uh, prominence above the cottage where I lived, and he'd watch the sun uh, go down. He, uh, he loved light. He loved the sun. He used to complain about light in Berlin. There were a lot of rumors about Herr Commandante, uh, some of them are probably unfounded, but uh, one of them was that he was a gay man and had interest in boys in the town. None of these were found it, I mean, his um, unfounded rumors. Then there was a, a student there, an uh, 18 year old named Marie, a little pixie-like uh, uh, woman from, who had failed her baccalaureate, that's the test you have to take to graduate from, from French high schools. And uh, she was sent there to study. That was her purpose. She had a tutor who was teaching her, uh, in which she had no interest. Uh, yeah, she'd go swim every day. She'd just be down on the beach every day and, and come in free and come to dinner and blah, blah, blah. She just had no interest in learning. Whereas Chrétien, Chrétien the, the waiter, who was a philosophy student at the Sorbonne, was very interested in, in, in Marie's professor and the two of them just spent hours there talking. Then there was, um, then there was this character, um, the, the Baron. And he's, he's kind of the major thread of this story, as much as there is a story. It's more just a portrait of the place. But the Baron was a, a gentleman of uh, uncertain origins, had a slight, I was told, slight Belgian accent in French. Um, very sharp dresser, Belgian linen, uh, always wore a tie, uh, silvery hair, bright, bright blue eyes, I mean, burning blue eyes, even in the dark you could see them. Uh, perfect gentleman, but there were a lot of rumors about the, about the Baron, how he got his money. I mean a lot. Uh, uh, to make a, a, lot, a very complex story short, he was uh, said to be, during the war, a um, counterfeiter who uh, forged uh, papers for, for Jewish families, and he would uh, get letters of transits and, and passports and that sort of thing and shepherd people over the border in Spain. Uh, then there were stories that he was a counterfeiter with supplied papers for Jewish families and then, do, and then get the <coughs> title to their property and do nothing about it. In other words, not help them. And so sooner or, long, sooner or later, the Vichy and the Nazis come along and round them up and he's got the house. That's only one story. Then just that he's a smuggler, which is a possibility. A lot of smugglers on, on, on Corsica. Others that he's just rich. Um, others that he made his money, you know, in crime on the, on the continent. Um, uh, it's just it's just not clear. I mean, some there were some consistencies, like one that he lived in in Charleroi in, in Belgium and came from a coal mining uh, factory family. I think. Anyway, uh, so those are the those are the main characters. I'm going to read you some scenes with them. And then if it's still raining and cold and there's time, maybe, maybe <laughs> Read about the donkey man. The donkey man? Oh, <coughs> you want to hear about the donkey man? <laughs> Fabrizio. Well, uh, okay. <laughs> I mean, if there's time, you can well, uh, you want Yeah, let me time. see, let me see, let me see if there's, um, let me just tell you about those characters first. Oh, and then if, yeah, there's, if there's time, I'll tell you about the donkey king. <laughs> she, she's obviously read the book. <laughs> no, he's a major. He's a major player. He's a local character. Lives up in the mountains. Uh, 
he was the father of another character named uh, named um, uh, Pierrot. He was the bread delivery man. So uh, what I was, I'll read you about, um, I think I'll read you this uh, section with Marie. Um, uh, she she was a flirt, to say the least. I have to, I should tell you, I guess, that she and she had a she was a, a, a girlfriend of um, Chrétien, but eventually uh, she took me on. Oh. <laughs> uh, I ended up with her. Um, and, um, and uh, but just to give you a sense of what she was like, I'm going to read you this scene. There there was a, a dentist. There was a dentist, a poor dentist from Lyon there who came down with his dog P.T. and uh, he had uh, he seems to have purchased the clean you know new shirts for this outing and he he was very unsure of himself I and mean, he would ask me questions about the island and the town and that sort of thing and, and a very shy man um, so he you know he stayed for quite a while he was there about six weeks I think um, the dentist named Eugène was his name. Eugène was uh, still in residence. And he seemed to have developed an infatuation with Marie. He was much older, perhaps 35 or 40 to her mere 18 years, but he was clearly taken. You could see his eyes following her when she tripped across the terrace to select her table in the shade. He would watch as she arranged herself to wait for the delivery of her citron pressé. He watched as she exited with her bathing apparel headed for her place on the rocks. Once or twice, I noticed that when she was sunbathing, he would find an excuse to stroll out the path beyond the restaurant with his little dog, P.T., his hands clasped behind his back. He would circle around the cove and select a spot under the Genoese watchtower. There was an island just beyond with this, uh, you know, these, uh, this 15th century Genoese watchtower there. I recalled later that uh, from this position, he, he could probably see across the cove he could probably see her from, uh, from across the cove, stretched out topless in the hot light. One day, I saw them walking together out toward the tower. P.T. was prancing ahead of them, tail on high. Eugène was carrying himself stiffly and formally, and Marie was stepping, stepping along with her deer-like, balletic walk, shoulders back, her hips swaying subtly. They were gone for two hours or more, and when they came back, she had her hand crooked in his arm. He held himself uncomfortably, his left arm raised across his lower chest and repressing a proud smile, as if he had just won an important athletic victory and was approaching an adoring public. <laughs> Marie was free with her hands and body. She would often reach out and touch you while she prattled on. She was not averse to squeezing past you in the doorway when she'd press up against you sometimes when she was looking over your shoulder. But none of this meant that she was particularly attracted to you. She just liked to be appreciated. She liked to be liked. This was the behavior that enraged Chrétien, who would fly into fits of jealousy and sometimes corner me in the kitchen and hold forth confidentially about her loose behavior, not to mention her stiff defenses against his passionate uh, defenses. By the way, uh, his uh, passionate advances. Uh, she always she claimed to be a Catholic. Her her parents were dyed in the wool leftist, atheist uh, journalists from Paris. She came, claimed to be a good Catholic, and she always wore this little silver crucifix uh, above her cleavage to uh, warn off uh, lechers. <laughs> Out on the island below the tower, she had probably laughed at something Eugène had said and leaned her mop-like head against his shoulder. Maybe she had tousled his hair or grabbed his knee to make a point. She would often take the arm of men and women when she walked, but in his mind, this freedom must have been layered with great meaning. He actually believed she favored him, and he must have invited her to join him at the dinner, uh, at dinner that evening, and she must have accepted, because we were instructed to lay two settings at the dentist's table in the corner. Eugène arrived early, as was his custom, and instructed Petit to lie down under the table. He had washed and put on a fresh shirt, one of his new ones, barely out of the box, I would say. He wore pressed slacks and leather sandals over neat brown socks, and he sat down complacently for once with an almost self-satisfied look. Chrétien brought him his usual care, not suspecting that Monsieur le Dentiste was about to dine that evening with his own girlfriend. 
Eugène was ever so gracious with Chrétien that evening, joking and free and not quite understanding or perhaps unconsciously suppressing the fact that Chrétien and Marie were a couple, more or less. A group had gathered at the bar, Mags, it's a Polish woman, a man from <coughs> a, the town named Pierre and a young woman named Serps who had worked as a waitress at the cafe the season before. They were collected in loose circle, laughing and throwing back their heads like barking dogs. And then, in the doorway, Marie made her entrance. As she often would do, she moved in out of the light and stood framed by the door for a second, waiting for everyone to look up and notice. <laughs> she wore her green capri pants, a tight black blouse with a deep décolletage, silver ear earrings, and many silver necklaces and bracelets. As if in surprise, she spotted the troop of her friends and made for them, light-footed, Halfway across the room, she saw the dentist. Hola, she said. Eugene, mon ami, comment vas-tu? And she detoured toward his table. He rose to greet her, but before he had even straightened himself, she reached the table, leaned across, kissed him on both cheeks, and carried on to the bar. <laughs> I saw the sunbeam fade from his face. He sat down, busied himself with his drink, broke a morsel of bread from the basket, and fed it to Piti, and then spent the next few minutes pretending not to notice the happy throng at the bar. Chrétien served him his dinner, not ever suspecting the assignation so closely missed. <laughs> that, that's, that's, my, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's Marie. Uh, um, she calmed down at the sort of end of the, the season, but, uh, <laughs> well, I mean, you, you influence. got to know her. Hmm? Your influence? Uh, we, <laughs> <laughs> By the way, uh, since we are going on, any questions in the, in the midst of this talk? Uh, yeah, what would you finally think of her? I liked her. <laughs> <laughs> I, I liked her. Uh, I mean, we were a couple, but I never saw her again, after, even though she was in Paris. You know, she went back to her old life, and I went back to mine. Um, I will read you, uh, I don't want to keep you too long, I'll read you the Herr Comandante part. He, uh, as I said, you know, he was uh, this German guy. Uh, um, where is he? Um, I came out to the uh, down on the terrace one evening, one afternoon, and I saw this crowd of local men standing around. Uh, uh, the, the Jean-Pierre, the, the boss, uh, and they were just having this heavy talk, you could tell. I mean, like four or five men standing around, you know, I, who knows what they're saying. And, and uh, Jean-Pierre, oh, yeah, like that, you know, and he came back up onto the terrace. He passed, I was sitting with his wife around and she said, what's up? And he said, wow, well, it's Herr uh, Comandante. Uh, he was seen with a boy in the town. And these local people, Mind you, they, they weren't upset. They weren't out to kill him or anything. They just wanted, they wanted Jean-Pierre to keep an eye on him and ask him not to go in the town and pick up young boys. Fair enough. Here comes Dante was mortified when he heard that he tried to leave. Um, and he, you know, he had his bags packed and everything. And you know, the, they don't care. This, that's one of the things I liked about the Rose Cafe. They, they were totally uh, accepting of everything. You know, literally, I mean, crime as well as, uh, uh, any, you know, anything, and they talked him into staying. But after that, he changed a little. He got, he, he became, you know, after his outing, so to speak. You know, it was all unsaid before. Don't ask, don't tell. But then he was out, and he just became more, he was looser, and he, he started to drink more, uh, among other things. And one night there, hot, nice hot night. You know, he was, um, he was getting pretty, pretty drunk, and. Uh, and he asked me to take a drink with him. Uh, so, you know, I had dishes to clean, clean and I thought, but I said, yeah, all right, why not? And um, I was always curious, because you see, he's just about the right age to, to have been in the war. Uh, he, he just about the right age to have been a soldier. So I was always curious, um, but I never dared ask him. You know, I'm curious to know his, his story. I never dared ask him, but on this night, he was drunk enough, I figured, you know, He's going to talk. <laughs> now, so I asked, and he, he willingly responded. He said, uh, 
Yeah, mm -hmm. well, you are knowing the Hitler Jungen, perhaps, the Hitler youth, he said, and he, without pause or shame, actually. Yeah, well, that was me, he said. Uh, for my part, I'm hating Hitler, and uh, not me alone, you should understand, other boys too, but what choice is there? They, you don't join, and they think you are a Jew, so then they just kill you. We are all knowing this, or in my case, uh, maybe worse, maybe the caporal, he, he finds out you're a homosexual, so you know, he pressed, he pressed his palms together in an attitude of prayer and lifted his eyes to the heaven, heavens. You had a pink badge and the people, they mock at you, they kick you. Some, some of those boys went off to the camp with the Jews, kaput. You never see them again. When he was 17, he said he was drafted. He went through a brief training and then was sent out to fight. He said he had no interest whatsoever in fighting. All he wanted to do was survive. I was not brave, he confessed. He lowered his voice at one point. He was sweating in the heat now and smoking sloppily and spilling ashes in his beer. You want to know a secret, he said. I'm telling you something. In the war, I'm with some soldiers up in Normandy somewhere. We are, we are in a ditch planning an ambush, yeah? And along comes a big troupeau of the Americans, my gang. We see that we are too few in number to fight, so they all slip back into the woods, retreat. Not me. I am lying in the ditch, and when the American boys are just a few meters off, I throw out my rifle in the dust and raise my hands. Uh -huh. Merci, please, merci. Of course they take me prisoner, but let me tell you something. He leaned forward. That's just what I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> the Americans put him in a cellar in a building with a sheltered upper floor, along with some other prisoners. They fed him, gave him dry bedding, straw, and hay, and kept the group there for a week. Then they herded them onto trucks and took them to La Havre, and he was loaded onto a troop ship. So he uh, crosses, um, crosses over New York, and then they take trains, they, and he doesn't know where he is, you know, he has no idea, but they're going through this beautiful country, he said, he described to me, you know, with uh, uh, green fields and, and white, um, white fences with the horse and the cow, and big squares, you know, the white fences. They were housed in a newly constructed barracks that smelled of freshly cut pine with clean latrines and narrow but comfortable cots with rough, clean-smelling sheets. Herr Commandante said for the first time since the war began, it was comfortable. They ate well. The work was easy. They cut hay, milked cows twice a day, did a little ditching now and then, but they had full breakfasts and big suppers at night with sweating glass pitchers of iced tea and milk. They could write letters, they were supplied with cigarettes, and the guards were lazy. Nobody bothered them as long as they didn't try to run away. Mm. One day early on, uh, the, we were called out to Mosta, he said. It was a Sunday. And they had a big midday meal. Then afterward, the boss man, he comes out and he gives a big speech. We don't know what the hell he is saying. All is in English. <laughs> Nobody can understand except one word, America. But he's smiling spreading his arms, and then we are going out into the barnyard, and there's this big barrel, you see, the guards, all laughing and slapping us on the back, friendly. Some of us are thinking, ah, now it comes, now we to be killed. <laughs> <laughs> no, they bring out a big bag of salt, then ice, then big cream from the dairy, then sugar, a huge amount of sugar. We never see so much sugar. There's a handle, you see, on the barrel, and we share the turning Maybe half an hour we are turning that handle, then the guards come with the bowls and the spoons and they open the barrel up and take out, you know what they take out? <laughs> ice cream. Ice cream. Yeah. Vanilla ice cream. <laughs> They're filling the bowls for themselves. They go off and they show us more spoons, more bowls, as much as we want. Everybody is so happy. Some of us, we begin singing the old song. Some soldiers there, they know harmonies. And the singing goes on into the night, and the guards are laughing with us. They're just boys like us, you know, long, narrow-faced American farm boys with bad teeth. <laughs> and so every Sunday afternoon is like that. Ice cream making, wonderful hot sun singing. Every Sunday, this boss with his speech is America, he says, over and over again. We understand that, but nothing else. Nobody, uh, everybody, everybody there, they like that boss. They like this prison. He shook his head and began to laugh bitterly. That's very funny, Nick yeah. We are all liking this prison. <laughs> so he, uh, wow. a bad, yeah. bad day for him was, was the end of the war. <laughs> <laughs> they, came, they came to him and, you know, they said they're free and then reverse journey. And he's, uh, um, it's actually interesting him here. He, he was sent back on, 
ships, and there were all these horses uh, on the ship, and he could hear them. Uh, they were meant uh, for meat, I think, for the refugee camps. But he could hear them uh, in the night. He, he could, uh, those horses, they're terrified. What, what, what do you say? They are calling to be free. He attempted a drunken whinny, throwing back his head. People at the bar looked over. You can hear them sometimes in the, in the night. Not I'm thinking. I'm like those horses, I am mm. thinking. Yeah, a uh, fear uh, uh, in einer stall, horse in a cage, that's me. So you, so you get a sense of this mm. poor guy, you know, and Corsica was liberation for him. He, 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 uh, he, just, he, he loved the light, and I don't know what happened, so he left the